What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Simon Mihailovich, founder and managing partner of the Bullion Reserve, a professionally managed private vehicle that holds only physical gold, while at the same time providing a full service solution that ensures legal compliance, jurisdictional diversification, liquidity, physical access, and deliverability, all within a single structure that maximizes flexibility, and in the words of TBR's founders, enables the use of gold bullion as a deep, out-of-the-money put option on the failure of extreme monetary policies with an asymmetric upside. Because Simon and I go back some years, this is a more congenial episode than you might otherwise expect, though I think in this case, it actually makes for a much better conversation because Simon has a very interesting personal story and one that he recently shared in an episode of the Grant Williams podcast back in June as part of his Endgame series. And while I've known Simon for a decade now, I never actually heard him speak at such length about his experience living in and emigrating from the Soviet Union and how that experience informs his political and investment philosophy today. We spent most of the first hour and change discussing that experience and drawing from it economic, political, and social lessons that we can apply to the present moment. The last 20 to 25 minutes or so is spent specifically on TBR and the value proposition of holding gold bullion in a world where the traditional safe haven asset of U.S. Treasuries no longer inspires the same degree of investor confidence that it did only 10 or 20 years ago, and what that means for not only portfolio construction, but political and social stability as well. Because some of today's conversation deals with investing, it's important to make absolutely clear that nothing we discuss on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guests are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, please enjoy this special midweek episode with my guest, Simon Mihailovich. Simon Mihailovich, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you for having me. It's great having you on, my friend. It's great to be here. You and I have known each other for what, 10 years, Simon? At least. Do you remember where we met? I think it was at Grant's conference, right? It was a Grant's conference many years ago. And when you were a producer of, um, I forgot the name of the program. Capital Account. Capital Account. That's exactly right. That's how we met. Yeah. I think we actually met down at the bar after the conference was over. I don't know that we met before that. I think it's an easy assumption. Yeah. It's a good assumption, but I'm sure it's I've met, sure I've met a lot of folks through Jim Grant, either directly or as a result of the conference. Uh, that's how I met Chris Cole and and I can't even remember now. I mean, I first saw Mark Cahotis there. Like it he he has a great gathering. He's had great gatherings over the years. But now with the pandemic, I don't know how that's gonna play. You know, I mean at some point I guess it'll come back. Look, life is gonna come back. I mean, but yeah. this is not the first pandemic or epidemic in the world. So yeah, this too shall pass. So it's great having you on the podcast. You were recently on Grant Williams' podcast, another mutual friend. I think that I believe that podcast was June 11th or something like that. And I, even though we've known each other, I was used to talking to you about precious metals or financial markets. And of course, I knew that you emigrated from the Soviet Union, but I didn't know the specifics of your story. And I was captivated by it. I was captivated by the way you described not just your journey, but also the end of the Soviet Union, your personal experience of it in the final years when you were there, as well as your general experience of it as you were watching it, I assume, Mm -hmm. collapse, if maybe we could think of a better word, dissolve. Maybe that's actually the ideal word to use. Right. Because it wasn't just the Soviet Union as an institution that dissolved. It was an ideology. It was a way of life. And that's something I really want to get into as a prelude or a stepping stone into a a larger discussion that I think can be instrumental for understanding where we are today in the United States and as Westerners. But first of all, another thing I didn't know about you was that not only did you grow up in the Soviet Union, I did know that, but I didn't know that you grew up in Leningrad, in St. Petersburg. 
And of course, Leningrad is the famous place of the siege of Leningrad. I think almost two years or two and a half years of basically starvation conditions that the people had to endure through. So your, I presume your grandparents lived through that? They did. 900 days. I mean, that's wild, right? And I'm, I'm always fascinated by these types of, the people that survive these types of cataclysms, the qualities that you find in those types of folks, whether it's the Nazi death camps or in this case, again, Leningrad. I guess, first of all, we'll have a chance also to get into what you do professionally. So first of all, why don't you just tell me a little bit about what that was like? Like, what? who are you? What's your personal story? Can you kind of walk well, us down, down, I, down the where path? Where I grew up and who I, and who I am is <laughs> a bigger topic. But I mean, I grew up in, I was born in Leningrad or now St. Petersburg. My parents were born there as well and grew up there as well. My grandparents came from different parts of, Russia, you know, mostly Ukraine and, and Latvia, which is the uh, Western Russia. But they all moved after the revolution. They moved to uh, St. Petersburg or Leningrad and they had their kids there. And my parents met there and married there. My, I guess of the four grandparents, one was evacuated during World War II, but three were in the siege, as were my great grandparents and survived the siege which was, that's a whole separate story. It's incredible. Uh, did they talk about days. it at all to yes. you? Yes, they of did. course. Yes, yes. But three of the the grandparents that were there, they were all in the armed forces. So one grandmother was a uh, military surgeon and my grandfather was a, um, he was an economist. He was a, a municipal transportation planner. So he was uh, working at what was called the uh, road of life, which was the only connection that the besieged city had to the mainland across a lake. And so he was in charge of planning, you know, trucks and transportation and all that. Right. Because there were periodic resupply lines. There from, were. And they, from they were the either south. by air. Yeah. They were either by air or, or by uh, water or by ice, depending on the time of year. I mean, to the point where he told me stories about the commanding general, who's actually the real person. I've looked him up since then, you know, standing there with, with a gun. And telling the drivers, if you don't go on this ice, I'm shooting you right here and now. Because people didn't want to, you know, nobody wanted to drive because the Germans were shelling. The cars were going underwater. I mean, just to understand, I mean, the depth of the predicament there is these trucks, they had to take off the doors, off the trucks. This is 40 below winter. They're going on ice. They had to take off the doors because whenever the shell fell in the wrong place and the truck would start going down, if the doors weren't off, you'd be trapped and drown, at least with the doors off, drivers had a chance to jump out before the truck went down. But can you imagine driving with open doors, with no doors at 40 below? How long was the drive? Uh, Probably a couple of hours. I mean, it's- Wow, that's crazy, man. Yeah, 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 it was crazy. Anyway, so my, yes, I've heard those stories and how they survived and all that. And, uh, but but of course, by the time my parents were evacuated, they were not, they were children. So they were not there. They were evacuated to uh, Siberia or Kazakhstan, whatever, far east. And uh, yeah, it was a real experience. And then a lot of stories from that. Then they came back and they grew up there and I was born there and I grew up there. And we left in 1978. So you were, yeah, you were born in 1961, right? I was born in 59. 1959. 59. Okay. So you lived for the first 20 years of your life, your adolescence, your Correct. formative years yes. in the Soviet Union. Yes. I went to nursery school, kindergarten, school through high school, and two years of college. What was that like? I'm curious. Your general impressions of it, looking back on it now as an adult who lives in the West. Well, it's well, it's an interesting question because you know, from a child's point of view, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's like going to school and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and thinking that very similar. It is, it's very similar. You know, before we had this interview, you know, I was thinking about this conversation. You know, I realized that a lot of people, a lot of Americans think of, you know, know anything they know from this about the Soviet Union is sort of connected to uh, Reagan's uh, evil empire kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they think that, uh, I don't know what they think was going on there, but I would encourage anybody who wants to understand a little better how it was growing up in the Soviet Union to Google, I'm going to say what to Google, it's called the moral code of the builder of communism. 
So the moral code of the builder of communism was 12 commandments, if you will, that were adopted in 1960 or 61, I don't remember, that all members of the Communist Party and all members of the Young Communist League, to whom all children from, I think, 13 to 20 or something belonged, almost automatically, were signed up. And to read those commandments to understand what it's all about, because they, people think that like there was people were eating people there, but it's actually based on Ten Commandments, and communism is mentioned in two of the twelve, and the rest of it is about taking care of your community, about one for all and all for one, about mutual respect within the family and caring for the children, about modesty in personal and public affairs. I mean, not terrible stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it didn't necessarily have anything to do with what actually was going on, which I guess is somewhat of the topic of today's conversation as it applies to where we are today. But the principles, the ideology itself, it it was not like, let's go and kill some people. Mm -hmm. It's the Soviet Union is the, I mean, we were told, is the beacon of freedom for all progressive mankind. Yeah. Well, I actually, I wonder to what degree a lot of people alive today have really no concept of the Soviet Union at all, right? Like for many Americans, they had an image that was provided to them by the American media. But today it's, for most people, it's ancient history and it isn't necessarily even history that's taught in school. My recollection is that we didn't really learn much about the Soviet Union, but to that point, I'm curious, growing up, what was your impression or understanding of the United States? How did you guys learn about the Western world? Well, I mean, the official version of the United States were the imperialist aggressors. It was in the middle of, uh, you know, as I was growing up, it was the uh, Vietnam War was going on. And so in that context, there was always a discussion of the United States as the forces of darkness, just like the United States was presenting the Soviet Union as the forces of darkness. Mm-hmm. And so it just was a complete, I mean, take the U.S. quote unquote propaganda or whatever ideology and flip it on its head and say everything the opposite, but in a positive way, meaning like, yes, we have freedom and they don't. Mm-hmm. We have, you know, one of the those 12 commandments is intolerance towards racial and uh, national, whatever, intolerance or prejudice. Mm-hmm. So we were told, well, in, in America, they exploit black people mm-hmm. and working people. And here we are standing for the cause of freedom and equality for all people. And in the meantime, you know, I was Jewish. I mean, I am Jewish. So as a Jewish person, I mean, you're massive discrimination. Hmm. Couldn't get into college, couldn't get a job, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. But in the meantime, the commandments is complete intolerance towards any racial or religious or any kind of prejudice. Hmm. So what I'm curious then, because this now, you know, I want to bring us to your, your move to the United States. What prompted that move? And who was it? Was it you and all of your family that left? And what made that possible? The move was prompted by myself and my father. I became politically aware at a much earlier age than most children. How did that happen? How did you inform yourself? It was an accident in a way, because when my grandfather passed away, my grandfather was from Latvia. Latvia is a Western republic that -hmm. was not part of the Soviet Union until 1940. It was part of the Baltic states that was annexed in 1940. So when my father passed away, for some reason, we sort of rekindled the uh, connections with his family in Latvia Mm -hmm. and started spending summers there. And uh, our relatives there were very differently politically inclined because their parents and they, when they were young, I mean, they were the older generation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so this was early 70s, let's say this started in 1970. Mm -hmm. So they were, quote unquote, liberated in 1940. And then, of course, during the war, they were occupied by the Germans and they were liberated again in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Some of the members of that distant relatives ended up in Siberia and pretty much spending life there because they were shop owners or whatever. And they were the Soviets took them and sent them out there. So they were small business people. I mean, they had a completely different view of the Soviet Union. Some relatives there had emigrated to Israel because, again, they knew differently and they they didn't see the Soviet system in the same way that people who grew up there saw it. And so uh, between that and the letters and the conversations, a month of summer for a few years, that, that would kind of, for a young, impressionable child, 
you know, that leaves an impression. And then, of course, my father, who was a freelance photographer, which is a very unusual situation in the Soviet Union, everybody had to have a job. And, and he had sort of a job, but his job was freelance. So he was by, I don't know, by design or by construction, much more of a free spirit in a sense that he didn't have to go to an office. He had his own little studio. And so between that and the relatives and listening to the Voice of America and uh, listening to the BBC and the, the German uh, stations and Israeli radio, whatever, uh, all, all were broadcasting at the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union was massively trying to jam all that. So it was hard to hear. I had a professor of Soviet studies. I took one class on the history of the Soviet Union and he recounted, this is like seared in my mind because it was so funny. He talked about what his early experiences were like going to the Soviet Union and speaking with people there who would laugh and say, ah, you Americans, you're so... He would say that they, in fact, Russians were better informed than he was or his friends were. That's what he found to be true. And he said that they would sort of jokingly say, ah, you Americans, you don't know how to read the news. You got to flip the newspaper upside down. We look here in the corner. And and so I guess that's another way of asking, was there was there a different approach? I mean, at that by that time, by the 1970s, let's say, were people already beginning to become aware or had they already become aware, or is this even not the right framing, of the disconnect between what they were told by the state apparatus and what they either felt to be true or knew to be true or was true? Well, I think this started in a big way in 1956. In that year, so this was, so Stalin passed away in 1953. Three years later, Khrushchev, who was his successor, gave a speech that essentially unmasked Stalin and the purges and the, the horrors that went mm -hmm. on during that time. And it's almost like, you can think of it as like Germans after Hitler in a way. Mm -hmm. But here, there was no victory defeat. This is the government itself admitted that this God on earth that people worshipped or were told to worship was mass murderer and a criminal. Mm. And people's ideas or ideals were put up on there completely upside down. So you can't- This is the period that people refer to as destalinization. Destalinization. But you can't get the dream back. You can't just build some construct- and then just say that this was all a fault of one person and that the system itself was wonderful and that he just completely perverted the cause of everything. Of course, that's what they said. But you can see from people's mind that people who've lived through that and even those who believed in the cause, if you will, suddenly discovering that it was all a lie. So that was a major gambit, I guess, by the Soviet government. But it basically led to eventual disaster. So sort of, if this is a lie, what else ain't so? Correct. So what else ain't so? But in exchange for buying into the dream, if you will, Khrushchev promised that the current generation, this is like in 1960, which is what this moral code of the builder of communism, where that comes from. Mm -hmm. So basically promised everybody that they would live under communism within their lifetime. So by 1980 something, they were supposed to be communism. Now, first of all, what is communism? That's the other thing. Communism is essentially, as it applied to the economic system, it was a situation, it's universal basic income, okay? Mm -hmm. From each according to his ability to each according to his contribution. In other words, the people were supposed to reach such high level of conscientiousness, I guess, mm -hmm. and conscience and social awareness that they would contribute according to their ability. They would diligently work as hard as they can doing whatever they can do. And in exchange for that, the society would provide them without regard to the value, monetary value of their contribution with whatever they need. And they would be so conscientious that they would not take more than what they need. That's sort of a little bit like kibbutz, the Israeli yeah, it, so version do you think of that? That, that. Right. Do you think that that is sort of something that can work in a very small society where everyone knows each other and there is sort of social credit system that can keep people honest? Yes, it can work. It's like a cult can work for a small yeah. group of people who are convinced of some ideas right. 
I'm not using it pejoratively. I'm just uh, sure. saying, I mean, that's how cults exist, right? People mm-hmm. suddenly get, a small group of people get convinced of some idea mm-hmm. as if it's reality, and maybe for them it is reality, mm-hmm. and they live these tenets, if you will. And that's basically what it is. But this is absolutely cannot work for a society at large, has never worked and never will work because people are different and different people have different ideas. Some people always take advantage and some people don't. I mean, it just, they tried, they gave it their best shot. So when people say that the Soviets, you know, we have an idea that communism or whatever, socialism or community property and all those ideas, universal basic income, that this can work, that the Soviet Union was different, they didn't try hard enough. I promise you, they tried hard enough. With bayonets to support them, they tried. It doesn't work. It has never worked. It can never work. Hmm. But it sounds good. I mean, it sounds... It sounds good now. And that's something I want to explore with you, which is, you know, to what degree the the language of today sounds similar to some of what, you know, people were told either in the Soviet Union or in the United States, let's say in the 60s or 70s. But to bring it back, so you you had heard things about the United States. I, I assume you you were able to see some video footage here and there, and some listen to some broadcasts. But for the most part, you'd certainly never been there. You didn't know what you were going to encounter when you got there beyond some of the things you heard and read. Mm-hmm. But you decided to make the leap and go. What was that experience like for you and your family? So you asked me. I did. I didn't answer you fully. You asked me how was that possible. So in the early 1970s, the Soviet Union started suffering from the wages, I guess, of its economic system in a Mm -hmm. a big way. They had a failed crop in 1972, and they had to buy American grain. Some politicians in the U.S. were able to take advantage of that situation and pass something was called Jackson-Vanik Amendment to a trade bill with the Soviet Union that tied preferential treatment of tariffs on grain sold to the Soviet Union to Jewish immigration out of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And so, because Jews were probably the most discriminated group there. Well, not the most, I mean, there were other Tartars and whatever, but I guess they had the better representation internationally mm-hmm. than some other uh, groups that didn't have diaspora the way Jews had diaspora. And so they passed a law here that made it difficult for the Soviets to buy grain without relaxing the immigration policy somewhat. But the somewhat relaxation was very somewhat. So, for instance, to leave the Soviet Union, you had to apply. Uh, In order to apply, you had to probably quit your job, quit your college, lose your... I had to lose deferment from military service because in college, you're given whatever, Mm -hmm. five years. uh, It's five years there was college. So you don't have to go to the uh, draft while you're in college. But as soon as you quit, if you have to apply, you quit. You're immediately eligible for the draft. Mm -hmm. So they went after me that way. You had to surrender your citizenship if allowed to leave. Now, so you had to do all these things, meaning leave your job, probably sell most of the things, because the other thing is you couldn't leave with more than $100 a person mm-hmm. and a suitcase. So you knew that ahead of time. So you applied and you knew that, A, if they said yes, you'd give up your citizenship and you'd only keep $100 and a suitcase. So when we asked, we actually asked them, like, what, what do we do with the rest? And they said, well, you can give it to your friends or family or, or spend it or whatever. It's not our problem. This, these are the terms. Okay, if you don't like it, don't go. You are branded a traitor to the motherland because obviously if, if the United States is a dark force and we are the beacon of freedom, then if you're going to the dark force, then obviously you are the traitor to the beacon of freedom for all progressive mankind. So it was a massive, I guess what I'm saying is it was a massive bet. Mm-hmm. It was a massive asymmetric bet with if you were not allowed, and there was absolutely no rhyme or reason as to why some people were allowed and other people were not allowed. Many were refused. If you were refused, you were screwed in the biggest way. Because you had already made clear that you wanted to go. Yes, you've exposed yourself as a mm. traitor to the cause, right? And wow. and you don't have a job, and not, now try to get a job after that if you're a traitor. But if they let you go, they gave us two weeks. Wow. Meaning, what, was it, co- what was it like finding out the moment you found out that you, you had been given the go-ahead, that you could go? What was that like? Well, well, I remember that very well. We were invited for you know a meeting at this police, whatever, this visa office, I guess. And, you know, the, the full reception room and you can see people go, you know, people are called and they go 
into the door and some people are coming smiling and some people are coming out crying. Oh my God. And you know, wow. so they call you in and there's a person sitting behind the table and just open the folder and says, you know, your case has been reviewed. You're given permission here. You know, in order to get your visa, you need to present the following things. You surrender your passports, surrender this, that, and the other. And you have a visa that's valid for two weeks to exit the country. And what happens if we can't get out in two weeks? Well, maybe we can't extend it. I don't know. It's your problem. So my mother, of course, was hysterical and, you know, <laughs> therapist wow. coming home, you know, to calm her down. Uh, and you can't take anything with you and you can't sell everything before you before they tell you whether you can go, because then you're sitting on the floor in an empty room because then you don't have anything. Right. So, I mean, it was terrible. Wow. But I think we got lucky. We got a two week extension. So we, took, we had 30 days to clear out. And so 30 days later, you had to have liquidated everything. You had to pay enormous exit taxes. You had to pay for visas, for the renunciation of citizenship, like years of salary. I mean, years and years of it. You have to say goodbye to your friends. Everything. And of course, when you say goodbye to your friends and relatives, at the time, nobody knew that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. So th this, is, this is 13 years before it did. And the travel abroad was extremely difficult and almost impossible. So it was like saying goodbye forever. It's essentially, the party to say goodbye to people was awake because you had no idea that you'd ever wow. see these people again, ever, in your wow. life. Your family, your best friends, your childhood friends, everybody. So you're leaving forever. That's it. That must have been such a, an unusual mix of both a sadness, immense sadness and suffering, but also excitement. Elation. Right? Yes. Elation, especially for a 20-year-old kid. The yeah. fact that you're at the, right at the beginning of your life, your most vital years are ahead of you. Yeah. But your think adult of, years. But think of my parents in their 40s and early 50s. You know, they're leaving careers. They're leaving. I mean, it's easy to say. Did you know, they make well, that decision for you guys because of their kids? Was that the reason that they did that? If yeah, they didn't absolutely. have children, they wouldn't have done it? Absolutely. Yeah. And we brought two grandmothers with us because we couldn't leave them behind because otherwise you'd never, the, my parents would have never seen their parents again. Well, that so, was the thought. So I thought that you, I, in my head, I had it that you guys moved to New York, but you guys moved to Baltimore, right? We did. I did totally accidental. I mean, we didn't know well, anybody did, you didn't anywhere. know anybody there? No, we didn't know anybody anywhere. So we ended up there by a fluke and showed up, you know, knowing not a person with a suitcase and a hundred bucks. A stateless refugee on a refugee visa had no passport of any kind for seven years. Yeah. But I imagine that despite the difficulties, it must have been like the most exciting experience in the world for you. For me, but for my parents who did not speak English, who- Bewildering. Terrible. I mean, really mm. hard, really hard to learn the language, to get jobs, but they were both professionals. Fortunately, they both got jobs in their field. And my mother was an engineer and HVAC. And my father was a photographer and he ended up working for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the photo studio in his field. He was an art photographer. Mm -hmm. But that, I don't know whether it's luck or pluck or what. So it worked out. Yeah. But yeah, this was all complete chance in, say, in a sense like it was a total gamble that any of this would work. So I'm curious now, this is also very interesting for me, to imagine what it's like to grow up in one world and visit or inhabit a completely different one. You know, I've seen extreme examples of this in the accounts of friars accompanying the conquistadores in Latin America, or for example, in the accounts of members of the Nixon Kissinger delegation to China in 1972, who described it as a totally alien world. Those are granted extreme examples, but still, in terms of the world we live in today, most of that world is accessible to us. And American consumer culture has pervaded most corners of the world, the exception of like South Korea, I mean, North Korea, and maybe a few other pockets, maybe some you know pockets in the Amazon where there are aboriginals running about. What was it like for you to go from this one society that was very different and also had a completely different information landscape and I suppose set of models for understanding the world and then coming to this one. How did you adjust to this new reality? How prepared were you to encounter something totally different? And was there any sense of disillusionment or were you able to kind of process it in real time? It's not as alien as you're describing it. It's a different situation. St. Petersburg is a Western city, but at least 
physically, if, if anybody has been there. The Soviet empire has, despite its ideology, has retained all of the cultural treasures of the Russian empire. So St. Petersburg had two philharmonic orchestras. It had two ballet companies, two opera companies. Hermitage is one of the greatest museums in the world. So the treasures of the Western civilization, the cultural treasures of the Western civilization. Of course, Russian literature is an integral part of the Western civilization and the Western literature. And so in a social cultural sense, it was very different. In a big C cultural sense, you know, New York is a cultural capital, say, of the United States, and St. Petersburg was the cultural co-capital with Moscow of, of Russia. And so the same core sort of Western civilizational values were no different. Mm -hmm. But yes, socially and economically, it was a completely different system. But you ask me, you know, how Russians or Soviets thought of America. Actually, at a human level, there was absolutely no enmity or against mm -hmm. Americans. It was actually admiration. There was a magazine called America, America, in the Soviet Union that was very difficult to get, but it was published by one of these propaganda organizations that presented America to the Russians. Of course, Russians have been enamored with the American Hollywood and movies and all that, even then, even though they were very difficult to come by, but on a pirated basis. We listened to Beatles and, you know, whatever. It's amazing. All, it's amazing yeah, how all that culture, stuff. Yeah. It was all not official. So, for example, they would, they would use X-ray film to cut bootleg records of Beatles. So you would listen to Beatles on somebody's chest X-ray, <laughs> if you can imagine that. Wow. Uh, this was before the, uh, you know, the tape recorders came around. So it wasn't like we were totally isolated. And because by that time, by the 70s, some people started, I guess what happened in the 80s to most people. In the 70s, some people started realizing that what they were being told is completely non-commensurate with the ideology or anything. Corruption, thievery, Consumer goods and deficit, horrible infrastructure, bad healthcare. Yes, education system was decent, but you know, highly ideologically directed, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so, it wasn't as alien a world. Maybe in the fifties and sixties it was. By mm -hmm. the time the seventies came around, it was not as alien a world at all. But by the eighties, then the bloom was off the rose completely, and that's where you know perestroika started happening, and that's where collapse, or whatever you want to call it, accelerated. Right. So, how much of it was that corruption and things like that that perestroika prompted the search for reform, the attempt to reform Soviet communism without dissolving it? It was. I hate to say it, it's similar to what's going on in the United States. I mean, it became clear that the system as it existed in real life, as opposed to in ideological slogans, mm -hmm. was not delivering for the majority of the population. It just wasn't delivering. And, you know, at some point, the rubber meets the road. And that's usually at the refrigerator, where there's no food in it, or not enough food in it, where people have difficulty making ends meet. And when enough people are in that position, I mean, that's, you know, be it a French revolution or the Russian revolution or whatever revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, that causes a disturbance in the society. You know, one of the interesting things that I've read from multiple scholars of the Soviet Union is how unimaginable the end, the collapse, whatever word you want to use, of the Soviet Union was. And at the same time, how inevitable it seems in retrospect, and how people have the same people look at, talk about it today versus what they actually felt up until the moment of the collapse. I'm curious if that resonates, if that's your experience. And I, I wonder what your experience was like. I mean, in 1989, did you have any sense in your mind that at some point in your lifetime, you would see the collapse of the Berlin Wall? And what was it like to actually see those images from the US? When we left the Soviet Union, the reason we left is because we felt that there was no future there, mm -hmm. that the system was completely unsustainable. Mm -hmm. But thinking that is not the same as predicting a collapse. Mm -hmm. The fact that something is unsustainable, and yet it is so entrenched that it is almost inconceivable that it will ever 
end. Not only was it entrenched, I mean, it, like I said, on the bayonets, you know, the KGB, the population control, the pervasive surveillance, all those types of things which we're now observing over in our parts here, they were very much a part of life at a much lower technological level. I mean, the KGB, I mean, they couldn't dream of the kinds of tools that are available today, but they did a pretty good job with the tools that they had at their disposal then. So it wasn't like these two ideas are incompatible. On the one hand, deciding this has no future and I want to remove myself from this and build a future somewhere where there's a future. Mm -hmm. And at the same time thinking, this is going to collapse. So I went back to the Soviet Union for the first time after leaving in 1988. My wife is American and she'd never been there. And so I wanted to show her where I grew up. I mean, I was very worried about going back there. So we went back there during the time to coincide when Reagan was visiting Moscow. And they had a summit with Gorbachev. And so I figured if I go there, I was not a citizen of Soviet Union or Russia. I mean, they took away my passport. I was an American citizen by when that you, time. Now, when you left in 79, it was 79 that you left, right? 78. 78. 78. Were you told that you would not be allowed to come back? I mean, what was the agreement there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you were told when you cross the border of the Soviet Union, your citizenship is null and void, and that's it. You're gone from here. But you weren't told that you couldn't. It visit. was implicit. I mean, it was implicit. Oh, interesting. So it was what? totally that's implicit. Interesting. Did something change that made you? Yes. Willing. What? Uh. Yes, absolutely. What changed was perestroika. All of a sudden, mm. there was liberalization, right. and it became suddenly possible. By that time, I was an American citizen already. I was not a Russian citizen mm. or Soviet citizen. And so my wife and I, we, we went and we got visas, and we went there as tourists in 1988. And so I can tell you from that experience that it was much worse economically by that time. People were having a much harder time even than we were having in the 70s. But there was absolutely no concept. This is before the wall came down, the Berlin Wall. There was no idea on the part of us or anybody who we saw there, my high school friends or, or relatives that were still there, that anything like that was possible, mm -hmm. that the collapse of the Soviet Union was possible was a preposterous idea. All you need to do to understand how preposterous an idea that was is to look up the opening stanza of the Soviet national anthem. Forever, unshakable, unbreakable, mighty, forever. That's it, forever. That's the opening line. You know, you, the English translation is united forever in friendship and labor, our mighty republics shall ever endure. The great Soviet Union shall live through the ages. You know, it's fortress secure. I mean, that's the national anthem. I mean, that's the, right. you know. So what was it like for you to see, uh, first of all, how did you first learn of it? I mean, apparently the president learned about it from CNN. Was that where you learned about it too? Of course, of course. Everyone I, but, learned about it from CNN. But it was clear that things were changing, even though nobody understood or appreciated the implications of the changes. I mean, it's like what Gorbachev was doing is he was trying to rearrange cards in the house of cards. That's deck, what he was trying to do. Deck chairs on the Titanic. Yes, yes. Deck chairs in the Titanic, but, you know, the House of Cards. You can't rearrange cards in the House of Cards. What is that game? Django or whatever, where you keep yes, taking exactly, out? exactly, yeah. Yeah. Because you start pulling one string, you start pulling one, you don't know what it's attached to, it could bring the whole system down. And that's what effectively happened. That's exactly what happened. And so it basically, you keep doing it until it collapses, but you can pull a few out before it collapses. Oh, it's still standing. Okay, so we can pull this support. Oh, it's still standing. And then, of course, you don't know which one is the one that takes it down. So it's essentially what was going on in the Soviet Union. And it kept on going until it just fell apart. Yeah. So I'm curious here, two questions. One is the, the observation, again, that I made earlier, which is that in retrospect, it seemed inevitable, but at the time, it seemed impossible. Do you think that's because even though we might, our brains might say, yes, this is unsustainable. We all talk about it, for example, in the current dynamic in financial markets. It's unsustainable. This isn't a sustainable equilibrium. And yet the implications of it being unsustainable, we can't imagine them because they're so foreign to our experience. One, that's my first question. And then my second question, you can take this as you will, as you like, and I can remind you again. My second question is, okay, now in retrospect, when we look at the USSR, what were the factors that ultimately led to its demise? So first of all, 
I absolutely agree with you in that everybody thought it was, uh, not everybody, but people who, even those people who thought it was unsustainable did not think that it was conceivable that it would collapse. This is called normalcy bias. This is not nothing new. I mean, some people left Nazi Germany as soon as Hitler took power and other people stayed and paid the ultimate price. And the question you can ask now is, what, what did you people not understand about what you heard him say? Or what did you not understand about the Nazi policies that, that made you think that you're going to be okay in that environment? How do you explain that? The boiling pot phenomenon. It's a boiling pot phenomenon. It's like, how can this happen? I mean, it can't happen to us. It can't happen here. We're civilized people. This can never happen. Also, the things to that point or the things that would have seemed insane. Like I think about that today for where we are in 2021. I think about it, if you went back in time to 1991, you told people, can you imagine that in 10 years, in 15 years, America will be less free than it is today, even though the Soviet Union has just collapsed? Well, people would completely find that implausible. The world, we, I mean, five years later, a few years later today, the way we live with the pandemic, totally foreign to the experience of a few years ago, but we quickly become acclimated to it. And it no longer we no longer look at the future and say, we might look at events in the future and say, that's outside of my experience, but it's no more of a step function than what we just went through. Look, I live in deja vu. My life is spent in deja vu. How constantly. do you mean? Everything I see just echoes to me how I grew up and what I saw happen afterwards. When something is not sustainable, it will not be sustained. That's a rational thing. But emotionally, it's impossible to imagine that, and particularly to someone who grew up with a certain set of notions about one's country, one's values, one's government, one's financial system, one's economic system, to step back and to say what I was taught is completely different from what I'm observing, and to have the intellectual wherewithal and courage to draw the line, intellectual line, from what I'm observing versus what I'm told and what the implications of that mm -hmm. either might be or are inevitably are. That requires some personal experience, probably, and that requires some rigorous study of history and a sober mind. And even at that, at an emotional level, it's difficult to accept or imagine because the implications are that are pretty bad. But what I want to say about that, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, a lot of people stop from thinking that way because they equate systemic crisis or change of a system with end of life in Armageddon. Mm -hmm. It's a fear of death, if you will, in a social form, right? So it's uh, interesting. Is that because... You know, like when you're in the car and you keep raising the temperature, you keep lowering the temperature, there's a point at which it's no longer gives the temperature, it just says high or low. Exactly. Because there's a threshold beyond which we just, it's just unimaginable for us. It's too horrific. So I, I'm not willing to make preparations for it, even though when you're encountering it, it isn't never as bad as you imagine it to be. It's survivable. It's livable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you and I talked before this, we started this. Look, I mean, the Soviet Union is gone. That way of life is gone. The old Russia is gone. 1917, it's gone. Russia is still there. Imperial Russia is gone. Soviet Empire is gone. Russian Empire is gone. Russia is still there. Ukraine is still there. People are having children. Living standards there are better. Chernobyl than they... is still there. Chernobyl is still there. Hiroshima is still there. And Nagasaki is still there. Yes. Through horrors and Dresden that got completely destroyed by the Allied bombing to the ground. You know, Kurt Vonnegut wrote a book about it, Slaughterhouse Five. These places are there. So life is, unless human species manages to eliminate itself, life is everlasting. And so to think in the way that people are thinking is very dangerous in a sense. It's dangerous for their own well being because they're dismissing realistic outcomes and actually probable outcomes that are not life-ending, they're life-changing, but they're not life-ending. And therefore, there are strategies and things that people can do, but they don't want to do it because it's like contemplating death. It's just too painful. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to contemplate that. And of course, people inside the financial system don't want to contemplate that because they're profiting from it every minute that it continues. 
So, totally. you know, keep writing till, you know, why should I stop making money when I can continue to make money? So there are perverse incentives for a lot of people. So back to that to that one question, what were the factors that made the collapse of the USSR possible that didn't make it predictable at the time? Well, it's so that we can look back at now and say, ah, those were the things. It's so clear to us now. It wasn't clear to us then, but it's clear to us now. What are those factors and what are those patterns and what do we see any of those today? What are some of the similar patterns that you see having lived in the United States since 1978 and seen the changes that have come about? I'm curious to know your impression. Well, I mean, fundamental systemic dysfunction is what led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So on a purely economic level, it was a dysfunction. On a intellectual or ideological and political level, it was a complete divorce from ideology and reality. In other words, what the politicians were saying was going on and what was actually going on didn't have anything to do with each other. And I don't know if you're noticing in the United States, I'm, I'm noticing plenty of it in the United States because you know it's nice to talk about freedom and democracy and, and the equality and this and that and the other, but civil society and the rule of law. But when you look at the reality of what's going on, so what did down the Soviet Union? It was perverse incentives across the economic system. It was pervasive corruption. It was ideological corruption as well as factual, you know, just corruption, corruption, money, politicians taking money. And eventually, people just found that it wasn't what they thought it was. And when that became clear to everybody, it just collapsed of its own. It's like it changed. And again, when I say collapsed, it's not a collapse in a sense like the building collapsed. It's a sense of people woke up in the morning, they still had eggs for breakfast, but And the kids went to school. So the everyday life continued, but the savings were gone. You had to suddenly work three jobs to survive. And, you you know, there were- Right. So that's a really important question. What do we mean when we talk about collapse? So yes, there's the obvious tangible uh, effect, which is that the economy takes a hit, your living standards drop, and we can talk about that. But there are other factors as well. Certainly in the Soviet Union, there was this disillusionment with the collapse of an ideology, of a worldview, of a place in the world, of an identity. And I wonder, is it too much of a stretch to say that that's the most traumatic part? Not necessarily, you know, your wages being cut in half or being cut by 90%. I guess, tell me, what is that experience like? And then do you see any signs of that happening here? Um, and and what what does that look like? Because I can I, I I at some point I'd like to share my own personal experience of, you know, coming of age in this country, where it is and when it is that I began to see things change. But I'm curious about your impression. The fundamental difference between the Soviet Union and the United States is that the Soviet ideology encompassed both social and economic spheres. Mm-hmm. It was patently unworkable in the economic sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the incentives were fundamentally perverse at an ideological level. In other words, it was an idea that sounded compelling that in practice actually could not work in the absence of a continuous compulsion of the population. Right. An overwhelming okay? police state, an authoritarian Correct. system. Without an authoritarian police state. Right. The situation in the, in the United States is very different in that sense. The United States has an ideology and it has or had an economic system that w- went with that ideology that actually worked. Free enterprise capitalism. Free enterprise capitalism with all of its excesses, with all of its difficulties, with all of its warts, nevertheless managed to produce the largest spurt of economic growth and well-being for a massive number of people. In reality, this is not mythology. This is true, including poor people on a relative bit. Yes, the inequality within the society is one thing, but the fact that most people in the United States have running water and indoor plumbing and a refrigerator and you know basic standards may be taken for granted, but it shouldn't be taken for granted. I mean, that that is the, there there are many places in the world where that doesn't exist. So 
this system has produced tremendous results. So I see fundamental difference in that there was no place to go back to basics for the Soviet Union. It, it, you could go back to basics, to moral basics, like purity of thought and one for all and all for one and this idea of community. But it didn't economically work. I mean, that system economically could never work. And it didn't in the end. That's the United States has a situation where its ideology continues, but the reality does not comport with the ideology. So we talk about free market capitalism, but we don't have free market capitalism. So when people say there's a failure of capitalism, my answer is it's a failure of whatever we have, but it isn't what free market capitalism is. We don't have that. There is no concept in free market capitalism that failures of private businesses entities are bailed out by the taxpayers or by the community. That's just not part of the system. So whatever system we have now is not the system that has succeeded and made the United States what it became. Can we go back into that system is a big discussion that I don't have a ready answer for. I don't think anybody does. But the principles of that system, which is free market capitalism and ability for the market to set the prices, to set the relationships, creating incentives for companies not to pillage and plunder their customers, as some of the financial institutions are doing and some of the big tech is doing, but to actually provide goods and services that people want to buy and are happy to buy and to compete in a free marketplace with other people who are willing to provide even better and cheaper mm -hmm. goods and services. That may be an ideal. I'm not being idealistic. I'm just saying that there are core principles out there and a proven record of achievement, not universal, not for everybody, with a lot of problems, but nevertheless, of legitimate achievement on the merits. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that gives me a lot more hope than, let's say, some situation like the Soviet collapse. So I, I, here's a question. As long as I can remember in terms of being politically aware which I would say goes back to 2001 with the 9-11 attacks. The world that is presented to us through the media has always seemed at odds with reality. And I understood that as someone that was Greek and had exposure to alternative cultures and news ecosystems. And so when George Bush would talk about how they hate us because we're free, I knew that was bullshit. And I knew it was an overly simplistic explanation. And I could see how different the perception was of, of my friends in the United States and my friends in Greece. So I had that, and I, and I knew that there was a discrepancy. It does seem to me that that discrepancy, I don't know if it's gotten, uh, yeah, sure, in many ways it's gotten bigger, the gap. But I think more importantly, more people see the gap today than saw it in 2000 or 2001. In other words, to what degree that gap has expanded, I don't know. But the most important thing is that more and more people are calling the bluff. And I'm curious if you agree with that and what you think sort of when this began, because for me, it really began with 2001. 2001, 9-11, the invasion of Iraq, that and the 2008 crisis, of course, and the way in which the government resolved that crisis or sought to manage it and turned our system from a financial system to a refinancing system. Those are the two major events that I think have led us to where we are today. I'm curious, how do you interpret that process? Like, what is it even possible? Oftentimes, I think we try to apply impossible, discrete timelines to things, and it's never really like that. It's much more continuous. But I'm curious how you interpret it. First of all, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that the gap is always there or was always there. But I do believe that the degree of the gap has increased dramatically. And with it, the awareness has increased dramatically. So, you know, I'd say 2001, I had a similar sort of epiphany, although I would say that the dot-com bust of 2000, you know, being in the financial markets, and then the way that was handled by dropping interest rates, I wasn't as aware economically and politically before that, like, for example, when they bailed out Chrysler, when they bailed out Continental Illinois, when they bailed out the tequila bonds, it didn't ring as much of a bell with me that something was fundamentally shifting. Mm -hmm. But after the 2000 crisis and then 2001 uh, Patriot Act, mm -hmm. where I felt that 
America has taken a sharp turn into a different direction where everything that I thought or took for granted in this new country for me, which is basically anything that's not expressly forbidden is allowed, right? Did you think of the Patriot Act then and the state response to 9-11, did you view it even then as an overreaction? Absolutely. No, I thought this was the end of America. To me, that was the end of America that I knew. Because you had seen much worse. No, no. But when I saw this, you, you have to, I mean, I can't impart it to anybody who hasn't been there. Standing in the security line in the airport, if you want to know what it's like to be in the Soviet Union, you are in the Soviet Union. In that moment, you are in the Soviet Union. You're in a line waiting for something. And at the end of that line, a lot of bad things can happen to you. People don't think that way. But in reality, that- well, I remember when people like Naomi Wolf announced that she had been put on a blacklist, on a no-fly list. Yeah. Like, remember these lists? These were new to the American experience. Thousands of people ending up on these lists, having no idea how they got on, but more importantly, having no idea how to get off. Like, you think it's hard to contact Google? Like, imagine trying to contact the government and not being able to find anybody to explain to you how you got there. And you're, you're on it. You're on it for life. Well, so, so when I stand in that line, I mean, I'm not on that list, thank God, and I hope I won't be, but I feel it very much at a visceral level because I understand how these types of population control measures evolve in the hands of governments and bureaucrats. And so to me, it's not benign in any way, shape, or form. But to most people, it's just like uh, Pastor Niemöller in Nazi Germany said when they first came for the socialists, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a socialist. And then they came for the communists, whatever, and I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I mm-hmm. wasn't a Jew. So that's what happens. I mean, people on this list is not you, and therefore, you feel like it's not about you until it is about you. It's amazing how different America is today than what it was in the 90s when I was a kid. I mean, uh, completely. It, it felt like a way freer country. When I remember it now, I just remember what it was like. Forget just traveling. Traveling changed dramatically after 9-11 to some degree disproportionately because of the fact that 9-11 was an attack using airplanes. Right. But I mean, the country is unrecognizable. And I, I often wonder if we were to be transported back in time 25 years, would we be shocked in other words, has it changed more than we even remember it? You know what I mean? To speak to the point about oh, I, normalcy I mean, bias. There's no, no, I mean, to me, there's no question about it. It's a completely different place with a completely different rules. Again, I'm not expressing political views. I'm just stating observations. The fact that the people in academia are being quote unquote canceled because of their Crazy. views, whatever their views are, that is so profoundly undemocratic and un-American. I remember how Nazis were allowed to march in Skokie, Illinois, despite the protests of Holocaust survivors, because it was decided at the time that the principle was more important than specific case. Yes, these people may be repugnant, but we have a law that allows people to say what they want to say, no matter how repugnant it is to other people. Mm -hmm. That's what freedom of speech is. I mean, freedom of speech is not being able to say what everybody is comfortable listening to. In the Soviet Union, by that measure, there was complete freedom of speech. If you wanted to praise the government, you could do that as much as you wanted to. It just, (laughs) as long as you didn't say anything against the system. What kind of freedom of speech is that? Mm -hmm. So, yes, no, I, I am absolutely, I see that. I think it's completely incompatible with our constitution. It's completely incompatible with the entire idea of America, which is what made the idea so compelling and a true beacon for the the world. That's Mm -hmm. the idea. Now, maybe that idea was never practiced because of course we had McCarthyism in the 1950s, but it's all a question of percentages, right? It's, there's always excess, there's always BS, there's always stuff. Is it 10%, is it 20%, or is it 90%? Mm -hmm. Where is the prevailing side? Is it the way things are, or is it the way things are with some people some in some cases? So when it goes from a little bit to MO, modus operandi, it becomes a different animal. And that's where I think there's a concept of bezel that John Kenneth Galbraith has, 
bezel basically is graft in the economy. Let's, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a little more complicated than that. And we can talk about it. But so his point was in defining that term was to say that during times when money is easy and credit bubbles, there's tons of bezel. There's tons of graft because money is easy. People are trusting. Everybody's making money. And when things go down, all of that gets wrung out. And then at the bottom of depressions, there's, all, there's very little bezel because it's very hard to get your hands on money. It's very hard to earn people's trust. It's very hard, you know, like two brothers, I've given that example before, just recently, two brothers in South Africa, 19 and 20, absconded with $3.6 billion worth of crypto assets. Like in what world would a 19-year-old and a 20-year-old would have an opportunity to abscond mm -hmm. with $3.6 billion? I wonder if what's happening, this just kind of hit me a little bit now. I wonder if what's happening is that after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the end of the Cold War, the lack of a concrete enemy led American politicians and the system at large to sort of feed on itself, to become more corrupt in the, in the absence of an existential threat. And that this is exactly what we've been living through. And we're at the tail end of that. I don't have any questions. It's really about accelerating. That. You agree with that? That's the competition. That's I mean, it's competition, survival of the fittest right. makes one athletic and, and nimble, and you have to roll with the punches. And maybe creates accountability, maybe also, because it doesn't seem to be what seems to be lacking today more than ever. There's been a systematic decline in accountability among the political class. And that, I think, explains some of the corruption that we see specifically in markets. This, the insane level of absence from a regulatory standpoint and the, the blossoming of so many outright frauds, right? It's amazing. And w where is the law enforcement and all that? But then look at, the, look at the regulators. I mean, they're just all going between private equity firms and then the government and back and back and back. So there is no public, I mean, there are no really public servants at high level who are career public service. I mean, the political appointees are not career public servants. Political appointees in all these positions are basically bankers or, or, or wealthy people who go in and out of government. And if they're not wealthy, a few years in government and they become wealthy by going back into the private industry and advising it how to uh, extract money from the government. I mean, that's basically what, what it's become. It's a revolving door. It's a proverbial revolving door. And that is part of the systemic decay of standards, if you will. And because you're right, fighting against the Soviet Union, there was some pressure. You know, failure was a real failure. I mean, because somebody is going to eat your lunch. When nobody's going to eat your lunch, you're relaxed. Do you think that America, since the end of the Cold War, has been in a long interregnum? Uh, in other words, that we're moving from one regime, one form of political organization to another. And it doesn't have to be very discreet. And I don't, I don't want to fall back on caricatures, but for example, are we moving from a, a liberal, open, democratic society to one that's going to be governed by some kind of authoritarian system? Or does this ship right itself, right? And we not return to what existed in the past because you never, I've heard you quote Heraclitus, you never stepped in the same river twice. Right. But to something that more closely resembles the system that's in line with our cultural foundations? I don't know. Nobody knows. So essentially what I think is inevitable is a financial reorganization because that's, it's not an ideological thing. It's a practical thing. There's only so far you can carry the system that we have. And I think we've pretty much carried it as far as it goes. Is, is that right? Is that what you think? I mean, you don't, I you're, you're, so. you're not one of those people that thinks that this can go on for another 10, 20 years. No, I don't. I think demographics embedded into the situation. Is that the primary driver in your view? Well, it's a combination of things. I mean, you have, it's certainly a catalyst. I mean, it's a catalyst that cannot be avoided. The population is aging. 75 million baby boomers are just naturally retiring. They're going to give up power because they're just getting old. This administration is probably the last baby boomer administration. I don't know. Maybe maybe we got one more round of Trump. I, you know, I doubt. I don't know. But I think there's a generational change that's coming. I think that the promises, not I think, I believe that promises that have been made and commitments that have been made through the Social Security system and the uh, Medicare and Medicaid system are not unfundable, unmeetable. They're just not meetable. 
the United States has obligations with like about 700% of GDP or something like that. There's just no way to do this. Well, most of these obligations are owned by baby boomers. So is the default going to happen on their watch? Absolutely. So they're going to have, at some point, they're going to have to be sacrificed effectively for the system yes. to yes. transition. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if they don't want to be sacrificed, they will be sacrificed by the next generation because it's unfunded system, right? So it's pay as you go. So it's the younger people that have to fulfill these obligations. And once baby boomers are no longer in control, why would the younger generation keep paying these people who left That's them with this, with this situation? So the pathway for you is still the, the political machinery. You think that ultimately it's going to be a, a situation? No. I don't know. What I'm saying is, mm. it's I don't know how it ends. Sure. I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know when it ends. Right. What I'm saying is, you know, there's a concept is in life insurance as unpredictable inevitability. Like when a life insurance is written, it is inevitable that there will be a claim if the policy is, is paid continuously, right? But it's unpredictable as to the timing and the reason for demise or why it happens or whatever, right? But it's definitely, it's happening. It's a certain yeah. So I think that financially, a reorganization of our economic, financial, and monetary affairs is a certainty, is an inevitability. We cannot continue to borrow money from or print money from nowhere and pay for everything. Because if this was the way of the world, then work is not necessary. Value creation is not necessary. We could just print whatever we want and live with it and it would be wonderful. But that's not the way we're, the world works. I mean, just, it's just not. So therefore, at some point, we have to stop printing money out of nowhere and start earning it. So I haven't really thought this out clearly, but there are three primary, though maybe four, ways in which I could imagine that the system goes. One is political, like you described, for example, Donald Trump in 2016, he was elected in 2016. If Donald Trump had been a competent wielder of power, we could have been in a much more dangerous situation. So I, I think that the country was actually at a place where it may, I think we may be in a place where the country is prepared to elect an authoritarian leader, someone who's who they're willing to give power to. I don't know that if someone were to basically say, you know, American people, I've sent the, the army into Washington to guard the Capitol building and guard our senators because I think blah, blah, blah. I'm actually not convinced that the electorate would rise up against that, that the people who elected, I think the people who elected, whoever would say to do that would actually support it. Well, Hitler was elected and Putin is elected and yeah, he's being course. reelected. Constantly right, exactly. re now, he's not a Hitler by any means, but he's an authoritarian leader for sure. Sure. And so like, I don't think we're far from that, right? So that's one option. Another option is we get a socialist type candidate, a populist who just enacts insane spending programs. So that's one way in which the system could sort of move to a different phase. Another one is financial, like we talked about just now a bit, which is that the system itself could collapse. The financial system, the dollar could rapidly devalue, et cetera, et cetera. A third is geopolitical. In other words, that rather than collapse from within the system that the United States supports would collapse from without. And again, I'm using the word collapse and I really need to find a better word to use. Maybe again, dissolve. Change, change, change. dramatic, but dramatic change. change, a sort of rapid loss of confidence Reversal. in the system. Yeah, and that's something that we're, we, we again we see evidence of that already. The the international order is changing dramatically. Most of us, myself included, were shocked. Shocked again, maybe not the right word because it wasn't unimaginable that the U.S. would completely screw up the withdrawal from Afghanistan in such an unnecessary way. But we've seen this incompetence before. But nonetheless, it again, it's another example, just like when Donald Trump and Erdogan had their little spat and he sent them some letter, it was a joke, it was ridiculous. And it was another another example, another piece of evidence that the the international order that's been held together by the United States since the end of, of the Cold War, but really since World War II, is coming apart. So there's that. And then there's maybe the, a fourth one, which is much more difficult to describe and understand but something that I think you spoke to a little bit here and that other many Sovietologists have spoken to, which is what goes on in the psyche of the body politic. Because I think that's something that we've, I mean, I've talked about that in terms of nihilism. 
specifically financial or market nihilism, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's just nihilism more broadly. The the devaluation of values, the the glaring disconnect between what you've been told is true, what you believe to be true, and the actual evidence of your daily lived existence and what you see. I mean, 2008 for me, Simon, was like the quintessential example of that. Watching the government take over the controls, take over the treasury, and just completely bail itself out. And they couldn't even do themselves. Do It wasn't until a few years ago that they actually managed to put together some funding for 9-11 first responders to bring us back to 9-11. Well, it's, it, look, everything you're describing is potentially on the table simultaneously or in some conjunction. It's very difficult to say what the catalyst is. But economic affairs are much more factual than political affairs. You know, in politics and ideology, you can carry things for a long time. But what is their tangible connection to people's lives? Well, the tangible connection to people's lives is their refrigerator. And whether there's food in that refrigerator or not, that's the ultimate tangible connection. That's where the rubber meets the road. Can they retire? Did their 401k suddenly become 101k? You know, that's the connection. That's where the confidence comes from or lack thereof comes from for a lot of people. Go I mean, ahead. well, one could argue that that we have a long way to go before Amer- people starve in the United States. There are all, all sorts of ways in which we've been able to forestall that. But you mentioned 401ks. I mean, is that, again, because so much, millions, tens of millions of Americans have their savings in the stock market. And the stock market's been held up for all this time. I mean, and is that, in your view, one way in which the forces of populism could be unleashed? Because Dimitri, of, what is a confidence game? A confidence game is some sort of a usually financial arrangement mm. that is based on confidence of the participants in the soundness of this arrangement, but is financially and economically unsound in reality, right? Okay. So if we have a financial system and a monetary system and an economic system that is unsound fundamentally, but is sustained through confidence of the participants, mm-hmm then we are in a confidence game, like Bernie Madoff confidence game. So Bernie Madoff's clients thought they were rich for a couple of decades because they got a statement that showed some numbers on it, (laughs) right? And they thought they were rich and they lived like they were rich. And then one day it turned out they hadn't been rich in a very long time. They just thought they were rich. And so what I'm saying is that I believe that the economic system that we have and the financial system that we have are being held up by confidence and not by substance. That is not to say that everything is bad and everything is fake and nothing is real. But on a levered basis, it doesn't take a big percentage Mm -hmm. of quote unquote bezel to turn out to be not real for the entire thing to have to be recapitalized. Mm -hmm. That's just what leverage, that's how it works, right? So look at statistics. I mean, just look at what people are, how people in the financial markets are talking about things. They say that the net worth of Americans has never been higher. What does that mean? Well, that simply means that the markets have never been higher, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? They say that the company's valuations are very high. What is valuation? Valuation is taking earnings and multiplying them by some number. What about the earnings themselves, that they're being multiplied by some number? Where did they come from? Well, if the government is running trillions of dollars of deficit, what does that really mean? What it means is that the government is printing money that it is giving to people or to its own departments that are turning around and spending this money Mm -hmm. into the economy, which is turning up as revenues of these companies which then get multiplied to show valuation. So do you see where the of pyramid course. scheme comes in? Of course. And the so this is a circular thinking. This is a completely circular thinking. The markets are high. Yeah, the valuations are high, but, but the earnings are high. The earnings are high on the back of what? The earnings are high on the back of spending. What is being spent? Non-existent money is being spent, conjured out of nowhere. So the real danger here, what I see, the real danger and the real problem is the whole house of cards unravels in the sense that we find out that the government cannot keep printing this money without 
massive devaluation of currency continues to happen. This is how hyperinflation occur. I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying that's the technology of a hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is not inflation. Hyperinflation is loss of confidence in the currency. That's what happens. So this is a faith-based initiative, essentially, that's not based on substance. It's based on faith. And my point is that the baby boomers who are now retiring and who are transitioning from being savers to being dissavers, from contributing to the stock market every two weeks from their paychecks to taking out of the stock market every month to pay their bills, from buying houses to downsizing and selling houses. So this massive rabbit that's been traveling through this economic python, you know, is heading towards the exit. And that the poop shoot, the poop shoot. And that is it's inevitable. It's just inevitable. And then we're saying that the millennials are going to step in their in their place eventually at some point. But by any measure of wealth, accumulation, salaries and all that, they're not there yet. They're not ready for, to take that man. Mm-hmm. And this is the whole world has that problem. Yeah. So, Simon, let's shift the conversation to what you do how you occupy your time, because I it speaks to, I think, a practical question of what do we do? You know, I had a, a great episode, how long ago, I can't quite remember, maybe nine months ago or a year ago, probably longer. Everything in the pandemic feels like a wormhole. But the guest was Margaret Heffernan, and she has a great line in her book. I can't remember now the name of the book, but it's something to the effect of, you can't predict the future, but you can prepare. And I think that that's absolutely correct. I mean, I tried to do that a little bit here in this conversation, I suppose, though obviously we were talking about in terms of contingencies and possibilities that we didn't state it explicitly, but you can only prepare. You can't predict. You don't know what tomorrow's going to look like. And to that effect, you and I have talked about this before, you know, the system, the dollar-based international financial system, within the rules of that system, the risk-free collateral has been U.S. treasuries. Yes. But if you agree, as you and I do, that the system itself is unsustainable in its current manifestation, then in order to find the equivalent of a U.S. Treasury security or the closest thing to it, you can't do it based on the rules of the system. You have to look outside of the system. So to that effect, I'm curious how you approach. First of all, is your concern finding a safe haven asset? How do you think about it? Do you think about in terms of portfolio construction, some amount that you want to have in safety? What do you consider to be a safe asset? What do you look for? What attributes? And then to what degree do you diversify into some kind of yield generating asset? I'm curious how you think about it investing as an individual. Granted, given the fact that I already understand how TBR works, the, the bullion reserve, and I want you to talk about that. Well, I'm not in the business of investing anymore. I used to be. That's the business I used to be in. But when I concluded or came to some of the conclusions that I shared with you today, just like I did in the Soviet Union, I said, well, it's not a game I want to keep playing. And I want to start building something else somewhere else, as opposed to continuing to double down on what I believe is unsustainable and therefore will end at some point. And so I went looking for essentially substances or assets or ideas along the lines that you're talking about right now. So let's say if there is no U.S. dollar or if the U.S. dollar is suspect or if the U.S. dollar becomes, for whatever reason, undesirable or devalues or and the U.S. treasuries are subject to uh, restructuring or redenomination or, or because of the currency value, their value declines, what is it that will be considered risk-free in that environment, right? Because we know from practice that there's a crisis, demand for safety and for assets, a place to park purchasing power or to, you know, place purchasing power away from risk is overwhelming and compelling and massive. And in the last 40 years or 50 years, that was expressed through demand for U.S. dollar and U.S. treasuries. So if you, for example, pause it for a minute, that for a moment, that's not the place to go, then the question is, where is the place to go? So prior to the dollar taking that place, the place to go was gold. 
And I concluded, based on my examination, that that is still the place to go. People don't have to agree with me. They don't need to agree with me. Well, what is it about gold? Because this is such a difficult thing to analyze because it doesn't yield the cash flow. Right. And the the reason why it's it commands such a high premium. So how do you assign value to it? How do you think about it? Why are you so confident that gold is a a good bet as a safe haven asset in the type of environment that we're moving into? Well, I mean, it's not about gold. First of all, gold is something that emerged out of the free markets. Nobody appointed gold to be what it is for all the thousands of years that it was what it was. It is something that emerged from a free market, not only from a particular free market, from numerous free markets through time and space. The Chinese empire used gold, the Incas used gold, the Roman empire, the Egyptian empire, and every empire, okay? And these empires are separated by time, space, and many of them didn't, civilizations, many of them had no idea about each other. And so they all somehow converged to the same substance. And I think the the point of that is that, or at least my analysis of that, is that gold as a commodity has some physical properties that no other commodity has. It's lasting, it's non-reactive, it's very rare, it's whatever. I mean, we can talk about that. That's all in the books. You can Anybody can look that up. The most important thing about gold, I think, in the financial sphere is gold doesn't have it's not a human project. See, financial assets, all financial assets, and even digital assets, they're in somehow connected with human projects, meaning humans promise to do something or they have incentives to do something and they need to continue to do that something in order for this asset to be valuable. See, gold is a physical substance. It's a molecular structure. No human needs to do anything for it to be what it is. It's not connected to anyone or anything meaning a coin, a gold coin, like let's say a Bitcoin. I mean, this is not a knock on Bitcoin or digital assets or anything. I'm just explaining what I'm trying to say. Distributed ledger technology, digital cryptocurrencies, digital assets. There has to be networks. There has to be mining. There has to be transaction validation. There needs to be software and hardware. There need to be wallets, hard wallets and soft wallets. There needs to be an app store where those wallets can be updated and where there can be re-upped and so forth and so on. That is not to say that this is all disappearing tomorrow or anything, but this is all a human project. There are incentives that need to remain in place for the mining, for example, which is a transaction validation function, to be performing that function and for that function to continue to be worthwhile for the people to be performing it. It is assumed in the crypto community, for example, that this is forever so. We don't know whether it's forever so. It's, it's only been, been around for 12 years. It's only been around for 10 years, right? Gold is a substance that doesn't have any of that. There is no network. There is no project. There is no cyber space. Nothing needs to be happening anywhere. People used it in caves and they can continue to use it. So, so when you ask me, what is safety? What is liquidity? The question is, what is liquidity? So the, the bottom line to your question is when people are looking for an impeachable liquid asset that has no counterparty, meaning it's not anybody's promise to keep doing something or do something or anything. What is it that's the most easily negotiable universally, globally recognized and negotiable asset other than the U.S. dollar and U.S. Treasury. And I would submit to you that in practical reality today, it is still remains gold. There is not a town in this world where pretty much any civilization exists where you cannot negotiate a piece of gold, be it in a jewelry store or at a pawn shop or at a market or somewhere where you can find a person who would say, I have no idea what this is. It's interesting. No, I I completely agree with you. You know, a lot of Bitcoiners will take issue with this, but they're not right. They're they're wrong. If they well, it's reality. It's not my. I know, but I was going to make no right. But no, what I was specifically going to make a point, which is that Bitcoin is ultimately. So to speak to your point, gold is an asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. Yes, Bitcoiners will will say that applies to Bitcoin as well. It does not because Bitcoin is a liability to the Bitcoin network. The Bitcoin Correct. network is more highly entropic than gold is. Yes, you have to pay storage costs for gold if you decide to custody it, but you don't need to custody gold. And gold on its own 
doesn't require any energy in order to anything, survive. Anything. Gold can be in your pocket or in your sock drawer. Right. Yes, you can deposit it with a depository, with custodians. But listen, people have been depositing gold with right. custodians for millennia and it works. But okay, fine. But you don't have to do that. Yeah. You don't have to do that. You have to do that with digital assets. Right. But I want to clarify something, though, to understand it. Because again, these are difficult assets to think about or to value in sort of rational intellectual terms. Ultimately, does your trust in gold as a safe haven asset ultimately rest upon the thousands of years of history of gold as something that people have valued? In other words, at the end of the day, we can try and develop frameworks for understanding why gold is valuable. But ultimately, this is one of those situations where people have found it valuable for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and the entire world is a market for it. It pervades the literature and the culture, and that in periods of crisis, in periods of uncertainty, in periods of a confidence crisis, people search for a sure thing. And for you, Time and again, gold has proven to be this thing. Even now in this much more technological world where people spend more and more time in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera, and tons of millennials refer to gold as a, a not a barbarous relic, but rather a rock, uh, just a rock, that this is ultimately that sort of the gravity of the value of this asset as it's been expressed for thousands of years will re-express itself whether you like it or not. So what you're saying, the real question you're asking, is it an accident or is it just a matter of tradition that gold is valued or used in the way that it's been valued and used? And what I try to allude to is that it is not a matter of tradition. It is a matter of rational, practical choice made by multiple civilizations in various circumstances, separated by time and place. It has certain chemical properties that make it superior to all other substances. It's a combination of its rarity, it's the fact that it's non-reactive, it's the fact that it's dense. It has a lot of physical properties mm -hmm. that make it stand out among other things. And it is no one's liability. So one king, so when you think in terms of bigger picture than an individual, why is Russia and China, why are Russia and China and Turkey and some other countries have been, central banks have been heavy accumulators of gold? It's because gold is independent from the financial system. And for a sovereign to have reserves denominated in a currency that is dependent on other sovereigns poses problems. Mm -hmm. Maybe Americans don't care or haven't cared to date that their safe havens, which is treasuries and dollars, have only value at the pleasure of the government of the United States, because government in their personal experience has not overtly abrogated those obligations and promises, right? But in many other countries, it happened in their government. And for sovereigns, the need for independence is palpable. So look at what the United States had done with the U.S. dollar in the international arena. The United States has used the U.S. dollar and its control over the global financial system as through sanctions as a political tool. So if you are a Russian government or Chinese government casting no dispersions on either, and by the way, you know, no matter what we accuse them of having done or what we think of their ideology, no one has ever said they're stupid. They're not. They're rational actors in their own interests, whether we like those interests or not, or understand why they think things the way they do. So why are they accumulating and using gold reserves as a tool to gain independence? Because the United States has used financial system as a pressure point against them. Well, why don't people with savings extend that idea to, well, the United States may use the dollar or the treasuries as a pressure point against people who have savings? Because mm -hmm. Maybe, like what's happening in China now, they're saying rich people need to share. You know, everybody, we need to share your wealth because there are a lot of poor people. We, everybody needs to be good. So, you know, this this billionaire thing, they each said- Each according to his needs. To each according to his needs. So the value of independence, the value of freedom, you and I just had a political discussion of freedom. 
Freedom is not important to most people until it palpably, or lack of it, palpably affects them. They take it for granted. So people take safety in financial affairs perhaps for granted. They take promises made to them for granted. Whereas in an environment where all bets are off, what is out there that is universal, valuable, negotiable, what is it? I mean, Mm -hmm. silver, yes, definitely silver, but silver is much less valuable than gold. You really physically need a major amount of silver, even for a fairly small amount of money, and it's very heavy. I mean, try to get, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars worth of silver and try to carry it around. It's like 30, 40 pounds. You can't. And it's not, and these days it's not that much money anymore. You know. So what else is there? Of course, it could be your business. It could be uh some property. It could be, I mean, it could be different things. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting thing for me. I guess the reason why I mentioned this point about the challenge of valuing it a number of times is that I own gold and I own a good amount of it. And while I can't articulate to my satisfaction a reason for owning it, the way that I can articulate to my satisfaction a reason for why I did this or I believe that, it's a way of falling back on what I've known to be true my entire life. And that in a world that feels so different than what it was when I was growing up, we've talked here about change. It's kind of the ultimate bet on meaner version, I suppose. It's a bet that, yeah, things have changed a lot, but there's certain things that don't change that much. So, you know, in closing, Simon, I'd love for you to, to talk to me and, our, and my audience a little bit about what the Bullion Reserve is, what you do there, and why you created this business to begin with. Very simple. I mean, I, I felt that gold has been, well, first of all, I came to the conclusion that I felt gold would be a safe haven, as it has been, not because of the historical patterns, but because historical patterns are, people are rational. Many generations of people have made rational choices about this, and they have concluded that this is a counterparty free, neutral, independent item, which is feasible from a practical standpoint, which doesn't rely on anybody and which they can entrust with, with a placeholder for value. When you say it doesn't produce any income, so neither do $100 bills produce any income unless they are deposited and you take a counterparty risk of it being paid back. And of course, a $100 bill itself has counterparty risk in that the United States may demonetize it. See, nobody can demonetize gold. You can say that gold is this or that, but there are you know 200 other countries where they may have a different opinion about that and billions of other people. So it's no single persons or countries or a group of countries control. So when I, when I came to that conclusion, then my question was, if the purpose of owning gold is to create a reserve asset, which is why central banks own gold. It's part of their currency reserves. And by the way, the thing about not predicting the future, but being prepared for That's it, also very important, by the way. I mean, that's, that's a Pericles. huge- That's Pericles. That's yeah. Pericles. This is also from 700 true. BC. Yes. So this mm. is 2,700 years ago, this man said it. It's universal wisdom, which again, in credit bubbles, it's not true because people feel like their sky is the limit and there is no reversal and every reversal will be- fixed by grandpa or daddy or whoever, you know, the big guy. And therefore, I can do silly things, but they'll be excused. They'll be covered. But in the world where sometimes payback's a bitch, as they say, you have to have plan B, essentially. So gold is unimpeachable store of value. That's a plan B. Well, then the question is, how do you own it in a form that doesn't compromise those properties which you're seeking, which is lack of counterparty risk or minimizing counterparty risk accessible to market so that you can monetize it or mobilize it. Because if it's sitting in the basement, you know, buried under concrete, and then you're driven from your house and the basement is in one place and you're in a different place, I mean, that doesn't help very much. You know, it's not with you. So how do you store it? How do you manage it? How do you make sure it's compliant with all the laws? How do you make sure that you have access to liquidity? How make sure you have access to multiple sources of liquidity in different locations? And what if there's a need to move it? And what if there's a need to do this or that or the other? It's like with any logistical challenges. I mean, how do intelligence agencies deal with that? Well, they have safe houses in different countries and different places with money placed there and with people on the ground who can host an agent and help them and so forth. They have framework net- networks, you know, local networks, not electronic networks, human networks. 
you know, of relationships on the ground. So when I approached this subject, I thought in the same way. I said, okay, fine. So it's a physical item. How do you own a physical item in a way that maximizes its unique or specific properties that would become extremely valuable only in certain circumstances, potentially, okay? And it's those circumstances when it becomes extremely valuable when it would be the most difficult time to actually operate and navigate. So in other words, how do you have liquidity in an asset that's valuable that has those particular qualities? Yeah, how do you have access to liquidity? uh, How do you make sure that you can mobilize this asset? Or how can you maximize your chances of success? So if you're designing a contingency plan, the idea is you don't know what's going to happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a contingency. It wouldn't be a surprise, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what's going to happen, what are the elements of planning? Not a plan, because you can't have a firm plan. You don't know what's going to happen. So what are the elements of planning? What are the capabilities? What are the facilities? What are the relationships that you would want to call upon or may need to call upon? in a difficult situation. It's not a mystery. I mean, there it's, you know, if you sit and think about it for two minutes, you'll come up with all that. You need access to, you know, people in the supply chain, many multiple people. They need, those people need to be comfortable dealing with you. There needs to be trust. There needs to be a relationship. There needs to be some history. I mean, all those normal things, there's nothing difficult about it. So what I realized is there were, there were not readily available solutions like that, that would be independent from the financial system based on human relationships as opposed to institutional relationships and no relationships, which is like apps and the digital framework, that would be not 100% mess up proof, but that would maximize your chances and options and ways of handling adversity under unpredictable circumstances. And so that's really what I do. I mean, I've created a basically a service. It's not a business. It's a professional service that essentially tries to put in place or has tried to put in place and put in place infrastructure and relationships and access to potentially necessary goods and services in different parts of the world in order to maximize chances of success in ability to monetize and mobilize this resource if and when it becomes necessary. That's as simple as I can express it. Mm. So if someone hears this and they want to learn more about it, Simon, how can they do that? Is there a website? Just go to the website, bullionreserve.com. Bullionreserve.com. And if they have any if they have any questions, they can contact you or contact the company through through the website. website. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, look, Simon, this was great connecting with you. You know, you and I, like I said to the listeners at the top, it's uh, we almost didn't record this. I almost didn't hit the record button at the beginning because <laughs> we've known each other for a long time. We're friends. I consider you a friend. And yes, so I didn't hit the record definitely. button because I was just, uh, I didn't. We were just I chatting. You were just chatting. But it's great to see you. I wish you the very best. And thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone listening out there. You know, Every so often, I make a point to remind you that if you haven't reviewed Hidden Forces on Apple Podcasts yet, even if it isn't the platform you usually used to listen on, that it would mean the world to me if you took just a few seconds of your time right now to rate the show. You don't even need to write a review. Just click on the hopefully five-star rating that you think we deserve for the work that we do every week. And I say we because this is a team effort. It isn't just my guests like Simon who take time out of their busy schedule to speak with me, but also my editor, my phenomenal, phenomenal editor and unsung hero, Stylianos, who has been with me since day one, and our latest edition, Kate, who manages the Hidden Forces social media accounts, as well as many other people who help make this show possible with their contributions, either on the artwork, the website, the music track, the music track. Shout out to Sam Williams, who has developed all our music, including the latest track, that so many of you have emailed me about to say that you love it. All of these folks have a hand in making this show possible. So please, it would mean so much to me if you did that, if you took a moment to rate the show. And if you have a few extra minutes to spare to write a one, two, whatever sentences review of what you love about Hidden Forces, it makes an enormous difference to the podcast visibility and it plays a huge role in attracting new guests. So with that, I hope you all have a great end of your week and see you all Monday. 
For more information about this week's episode of Hidden Forces, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.